Coronavirus is not going away. Boris Johnson took the philosophy of herd immunity. It's actually not a bad strategy. If I put scientists and entrepreneurs in the same room, things get solved. The only reason anybody does that is why? Because they're hiding something. I just don't trust China. Zoom is a Chinese-owned company. TikTok is a Chinese-owned yeah. company. So they want us to use their products, but their people cannot have access to Twitter. People online that say cash is trash. No one is saying cash is trash today. Now on the opportunity side, billionaires are gonna be produced. Uh, new billionaires are gonna be born. There's never been a more important time to learn how to negotiate and sell than today because if you know how to negotiate and sell and you can't leave your house, you can pick up this phone and make some sales. Patrick, thank you for joining the podcast. It's an honor to have you for the second time. I feel such honor. Thank you for joining us. It's good to be on, man. I told uh, Mario, I said, there's something about Jay. I like him a lot. Yeah, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. And a lot of the people who follow me in the UK really respect your content. But what I want to go into, you've been doing lots of really good content around coronavirus. I've watched the content. I love the fact that you've researched and get a balance for you. I wish more people would do that. But look, in your opinion, what do you think is playing out here, Patrick, with this, you know, with, with everything that's happening at the moment, in your opinion? I, look, here's, here's how I see the entire thing. So coronavirus uh, is not going away. This is not going to be like a six-month thing. I mean, it's going to be around here for a long time. It's going to be here for yourself, for myself. It's not going away. But the one challenge that I think is scaring a lot of people is the fact that they don't yet have a solution. Think about it this way. You know, uh, uh, George Washington died from an ear infection, Okay. In the 50s, I have a guy, uh, the book uh, says, uh, I love capitalism, the founder of Home Depot, Ken Langone, who is worth four or five billion dollars. He says in his book, he's 80 years old, he takes blood thinners. His dad died from not having blood thinners. So if they had something as simple as blood thinners back in the 50s, his dad would have still been around. He would have lived longer instead of dying in the 60s. So my dad is 77 years old, not because after 13 heart attacks, he was able to really start getting things together. Yes, he stopped smoking two packs a day. Yes, he stopped drinking. But what saved him was blood thinners. Okay, so if pre-blood thinners, you know, a lot of people would be dying earlier and we would just kind of be like, well, that person died. I'm in the insurance industry, so for us, you notice the cost of insurance, life insurances keep going lower and lower and lower. Why is that? Because the longer people live, the mathematical formula says yeah. cost is lower. So you shouldn't be paying more for insurance today than you did 20 years ago. You should be paying less for insurance today than you ever have if you buy a, a policy at whatever age you are today. So, and the reason for that is because people are living longer. So now, the uncertainty comes from smart people like Fauci who are uncertain. You know, it's kind of like going to the doctor. The last thing you ever want to hear a doctor say is what? I don't know what this is. It's the last thing you want to hear a doctor yeah. say. You go to the doctor, you want the doctor to say, here's what you have, here's the symptoms, this is the medication you need, here's what you need to take, in a week, everything's gonna go away. Okay, cool, I'm leaving. You go to the doctor, the doc, like I remember one time I went to the doctor, I couldn't speak for six months. I had lost my voice, so I noticed something was building up in my, uh, uh, in my uh, uh, throat. So I go to this doctor, and they start testing me at Beverly Hills, and you see automatically the lady starts kind of panicking a little bit. And I said, uh, Jennifer, her name was Dr. Jennifer. I said, Dr. Jennifer, any reason why you look a little worried? And she says, uh, give me a minute, I'll be back. So she goes out, I'm like, okay, so, you know, this is the last thing you wanna see. She comes back in, she says, I have to send you to a different place because, uh, and we have to do it ASAP. I said, I can't, when is ASAP? Can you go tomorrow? I said, I'm speaking tomorrow in Hawaii. She says, no, you have to go ASAP. I said, I got to get my speaking commitment. So I go to Hawaii, come back. First thing Monday morning, I go to the doctor. They look at it. They say, this is cancerous. We have to do a surgery right now. And then they did the surgery. They cut the thing, and it was benign. But right. the reaction of the first doctor was concerning. So today, I think the biggest fear is if doctors and experts are a little bit worried, it's putting a lot more fear in the people. But what I believe in a lot, this is what I believe in a lot. If I put scientists and entrepreneurs in the same room, things get solved. 
yeah. years ago there was a song, I believe it was by Pet Shop Boys. Uh, uh, I've got the brains, you've got the looks, let's make lots of money. Remember that song? Yeah, I've got the yeah. brains, you got the. So today it's I've got the brain scientists, you've got the money, let's solve coronavirus. It's kind of like that's the time we're living in today. So the more those two team up together, I just see good things happening here very soon. Yeah, and that leads on to my, my next question with, obviously, you're in the USA, we're in the UK. My parents, who are from India, they travelled over for a, th a three, four-week holiday. Now they are stuck there in lockdown. They can't leave the country. I mean, literally, they've just 1.2 billion people. They've just said you can't go out. And India, I, I know you've been there because you did a talk there and uh, we watched that. And I've been there many times, but they can lock it down more than anybody else. Why do you think different countries are taking different kind of strategy because I watched into with South Korea and South Korea have kind of done pretty well with this um, and I was watching a, uh, an interview with the doctor and he was like saying yep yeah, testing testing masks glasses whereas in the UK they were saying we well, don't need to wear masks you know what I mean why is it is it because of what's your thoughts on that because that's an interesting thing seen played out you know that but that's life though that's life and, and what I mean that's everything we do religions you know everybody sits there and says uh you know, this religion's the right religion. I mean, here's what we believe in, but this is what we believe in. This is the ritual we do, and that's the ritual we do. And then we find out what ritual works and which one doesn't work. And you find out which religion produces a, a better quality peace. I mean, the way you judge a religion is by who's more peaceful. If you really think about it, you know, whatever religion is more peaceful, people say, well, why is it that this religion, you know, you, you get judged. If you look at yeah. nationalities and Middle Easterns, I was having a talk yesterday with Gianni Russo, who's a guy from Godfather. I was on his podcast and he had his, him and his a uh, few different people there. And I said, you know, why is it that Middle Easterns are known for being hotheads? You know, if you meet Middle Easterns, why are they always like, you know, it's like maybe because they came from a war type environment and that's what they're used to. So everything is survival. Why is it that Americans are uh, very big on individuality and, you know, going out there and self this and because maybe that's the system, capitalistic system produces people to be that way. Why is it that, you know, some other uh, philosophies produce what they produce? I think it's an approach they took. Now, obviously, at the beginning, Boris Johnson took the philosophy of herd immunity, yeah. which was kind of like, let's let everybody get it, which, by the way, to be quite honest with you, it's actually not a bad strategy. The only time it's a bad strategy, if you don't have the capacity at your hospitals, if you don't, that's when it's a bad strategy. Because if you, if you sit there and you say, well, we have this many ventilators, we're good if we get to 10 million cases, yeah. And if we get to 10 million cases, we have 2 million beds or we have however many beds and we're going to be OK. We're going to get through this. Then it's a good philosophy. But if you don't and you take that approach, that's when you take a hit. So the world is watching each other to find out why Germany is now the lowest death mm -hmm. rate out of everybody. They're at 0.4 percent, 0.35 percent on coronavirus. It's no longer even South Korea. It's now Germany. Why is it Germany? You know why? Did Italy take a hit the way they did? And why is Spain coming up? Why is UK going through a little bit right now? Obviously, Boris Johnson has coronavirus and is self-quarantining himself while still yeah. running the government. Why is Mexico not affected by it? Why are some of the... And Mexico is a high tra tourist, high travel place. Why are they not affected by it? Mexico is going about business the way they are. Texas, where I'm at right now, the governor just said, you know, they're a little bit more lax. They still have the quarantine thing going on until the 30th, but... They've said nobody from out of state, like, you can't come in. People cannot come in here. If you do, you have to be quarantining yourself for two weeks if you're coming into Texas. And, and, and that's one of the restrictions they're putting. But you're watching everybody. It's like an investment philosophy. Five of us are in high school together. We all are ambitious. All of us are ambitious. We're hardworking. None of us are schleps, and none of us are people that are not aspiring to do something big. And you say... Here's how I'm going to make my first million. And I say, no way, I'm going to make it faster than you. No way, I'm going to make my million this way. You got five friends, five friends, five different ways they want to go make their million. We're going to find out who's going to do it better. That's just the reality of it. Yeah, Four yeah. people are going to be wrong, one person's going to be right. And that's kind of the similar thing that's going on right now with how different countries are handling coronavirus. That's what confused me with the World Health Organization. I was assuming that they're the ones that make the decisions. But like you said, 
every, in your in example, every friend is taking is, is taking a bit of advice, but they're trying to do it themselves. They're trying to be. I don't know if it's politically correct because no one wants lives to be lost. But that's interesting how you mentioned how you can link it back to that. Yeah, you know, again, um, first of all, if if they if they start doing a pointing finger part, everybody can be pointed mm -hmm. fingers at. I mean, when I'm talking about like, oh, it's uh, you know Trump's fault. No, it's. Uh, 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 World Health Organization's fault. No, it's Fauci's fault. No, it's uh, Italy's fault. No, it's this. The one thing that is true is China tried to keep this away from people for some time. And even the young doctor, the 37-year-old doctor who became the whistleblower out of Wuhan, who came out and said, this is bigger than you guys think it is. We have to tell World Health Organization. And they're like, no, we're not going to. We got to report it. They knew about this five days prior to it happening. They didn't contact World Health Organization until December 31st of 2019. And that doctor who was the whistleblower, the 37-year-old, ended up dying. Nobody knows how the guy died, right? Yeah. So, you know, you, you got to look at some of the responsibilities. Here's the, here's the one country I have beef with, uh, and, and I don't trust at all, is I, I don't trust any country that doesn't give their data yeah. That doesn't give their data that's open. You've heard me say this in many different platforms. I just don't trust China on any data that they give because they don't offer free press. They don't offer free speech. They don't have our media companies there. They don't allow Facebook, YouTube, Twitter to be in China, used by Chinese, yet Americans use you know, TikTok all day long. Yeah. Americans use Zoom all day long, and Zoom is a Chinese... Uh, owned company. TikTok is a Chinese owned company. Yeah. So they want us to use their products, but their people cannot have access to Twitter. Look, I would trust China a lot more if their people could tweet and show us proof of what's going on. I would trust China a lot more if their content creators, 22 year old kids can go around making videos to show us really what's going on in China. But China's not going to let that happen because and and by the way, the only reason anybody does that, think about it. The only reason anybody does that is why? Because they're hiding something. Yeah. Why would you not want to show the world what's going on? I mean, everybody knows why North Korea does that. No one even questions that. But uh, I think the biggest black guy around the world, I think the biggest black guy went to China. And here's why. Naturally, you can't shut your kids up for too long. They're eventually going to talk back to you. I don't know if you remember the first time you disagreed with your dad. Yeah. What can your dad do? Your dad was probably pissed off. Yeah. It's like, don't you ever talk to me like that again. But you did it again and again mm -hmm. and again and again. Why? It's human nature. I disagree with you, Dad. Mom, I disagree with you. You can't shut me up. You can't shut a kid. The other day, my son, six-year-old, sits me down. And this is how he talks to me. He says, um, hey, uh, uh, Daddy, I have to tell you something. And he's kind of nervous, but he's kind of trying to test me. I said, yeah, what's up, Dylan? Tell me. He says, Daddy you, uh, Daddy, you curse a lot. I said, excuse me? He says, yeah, you curse a lot. I said, give me an example. He says, I can give you many examples, but I don't want to. I said, you mean to tell me I curse a lot? Mm-hmm. I said, so give me the words. I don't want to say the words. I said, give me the letters. He says, I'll just give you one of them. I said, what's that? H. I said, H. He says, mm-hmm. I said, what's H? He says, well, I say what the heck. You don't say what the heck. You say the other H word. I say, what other words do you, have you heard me use? I said, Daddy, I've heard all of them. I think you need to stop cursing. My six-year-old <laughs> kid calls me out. Yeah. Why? Because we have opinions. Yeah. You can't prevent people from sharing their opinions. Eventually, they're going to revolt. And I think the biggest thing that happened with coronavirus, it exposed China. And yeah. China took the biggest black guy. Because if I'm a country thinking about doing business with China, our arrangements are changing in ways they've never changed before. When the dust settles, look how hardcore Trump is going to negotiate with China. The two, three trillion dollars that we owe China of the debt, it's going to be forgiven. Look when this takes place. You're going to yeah. say that's crazy that it happened because uh, you, you can't be sitting around saying things like that. So going back to the World Health Organization, they started late. They they. Uh, 
They didn't originally call it a pandemic. They didn't say, stop travel, it's going to hurt the economy. Their words was, don't prevent travel, it's going to hurt the world economy. So even World Health Organization was a little bit more liberal at the beginning until they realized we got to kind of get our act together. So yeah. there's a lot of people to blame. <laughs> But the, it, it stems all from China. If you look at China, just quick on that Chinese point, but if you think they reported 3,305 deaths, 80,000 uh, cases, right? That's just crazy. When the US are looking at 100 to 200,000 deaths, UK are looking 20,000 plus, Italy's probably going to be, you know, these, the, the whole statistics do not make sense. So yeah. <laughs> if they're going to make this up, they should make it up a bit better because that just tells you they're hiding something, surely. You know, with them figures, it's ridiculous. Come on, give me a, you know, you know what's the best thing about America and UK? Here's what's the best thing about America and UK. How many people in UK absolutely hate Boris Johnson? Can we say 45%? Let's say 40%. Yeah. People who just call him out, you're an idiot, you're stupid, this is, you have no idea, why don't you fix your hair? This is the worst, you know, whatever. But they go at him, right? And then you got the other side that's like, no, we want Brexit. We support him. He's tough. He has a quality of Winston Churchill. We like what he's doing. The fact that UK can have 45% of the citizens who call him out, it's what makes you trust UK. Yeah. The, the fact that CNN and MSNBC hates Trump passionately and 24-7 they call him out, it makes you kind of trust US. The fact that Fox supports China, uh, Trump it makes you trust U.S. Not saying 100% trust. This doesn't yeah. mean the political game doesn't take place. This doesn't mean, you know, shadow banning isn't happening with certain YouTube channels who are talking about certain things that they shouldn't be talking about. Don't think for a moment that that's not happening. You better believe right now there was a 60 Minutes interview that was done nine weeks ago where the CEO of YouTube was being called out by ABC saying, why are you letting people on YouTube create any content? And they're saying, because we're not a news channel. We're just a content creator. We're a social media company. Says, no, you can't let these people. They're not journalists. And she says, how do you know what's journalist? <laughs> is journalist just somebody that goes to college and gets a degree? What is journalism? Let's define journalism. So the fact that in UK and US, the own administration gets called out as much as they do, that ought to give people more trust. Because you can always tune into a channel that doesn't like the president. Yeah, it's just having different types of, types of views. So look, we've talked the political side, and obviously that could, we could probably do an hour or two hours on that. Now the business side, obviously your entrepreneurships, and I've got, you know, I have people that follow my podcast. The economy, the economy. Now a lot of my questions I'm getting now, and I'm, people I work with is around, what is the impact of the economy? Because look, at the moment, it's just a big fat pause um, in many, many industries. Um, some are still going, that's great. But how do you think this can, this can impact the economy? Because People are shooting business. A friend of mine let 400 staff go. He's part of theme parks. He just had to let them go. He had to make that decision because he couldn't carry the cash flow. Now, the government are helping. There's a lot of headline grabbing here. There's no actual detail on when they're going to get support. Where do you think this is going, Patrick, with the economy on the business side? Because there's a lot of people very, so, you know, and normally they're worried at the moment. Yeah, and, and they should be. I mean, listen, I, I can't sit here and just say, oh, don't worry about everything. I'm going to give you different, different perspectives so everybody kind of sees it from a different uh, view. There's three different types of people right now with the uh, economy that we're experiencing. The first kind are those that are relying on the government to bail them out. I mean, they're, they're not ready for it. They are scared, and yeah. the government needs to bail them out. And quite frankly, uh, in the U.S., they're saying they're going to give unemployment or whatever for 39 weeks. During those 39 weeks, those people who get bailed out, they're not going to change. They're going to stay the same, mm. meaning they're not going to pick up books behind them or behind yours and just start reading books to say, I don't ever want this thing, thing to happen to me again, ever. I don't want to go through this again. They're just going to live life the same way, watch Netflix, play video games, do whatever they're going to do. Second kind of uh, uh, groups of people that we have are those that are prepared for it. They're not being affected by it at all, whatsoever. Uh, they are losing money, but they're not losing sleep worrying about they're going to be fine if this thing goes like this for five more years they're fine because they have cash in place yeah yeah and they've been prepared for a time like this those guys are not worried about it the third group are those who are going through this and this is their first time experiencing a black swan white swan whatever you want to call it where this came out of nowhere 
And, and those are the people, you know, certain things happen to certain, how many people you know that are millionaires? That uh, when you ask them, what was the motivation to want to become a millionaire? They say, I grew up being poor. I told myself, I will never be poor. Dave Chappelle, who's a comedian, said, we grew up so poor. I screamed at my dad one time saying, I will never be poor. I will be a millionaire because he hated being poor. You got a lot of people that don't want to be poor. You can have certain people today that will say, this will never happen to me again. I'll never be surprised like this ever again. They're going to take saving cash more seriously. Yeah. They're going to pay attention to the words emergency fund more seriously today than ever before. And they're going to realize the value of setting money aside and not buying everything that you see during times like this because it's critical, right? So, so let's set that part aside. Let's bring back to your entrepreneurs that you're talking about. There's a reason why it's important for a company to be sitting on a lot of cash. And you know, you hear a lot of people online that say cash is trash, cash is trash, cash is trash. You know who's saying cash is trash today? Nobody. No one is saying cash is trash today. Not yeah. a single content creator is saying cash is trash today. Not a single one. Why? Because cash is not trash. Yeah. Because we have to have some cash. If you got a wife and kids, you got to have some cash. If you got employees, you got to have some cash. If you're trying to hire people and make sure you're pre prepared for a rainy day, you got to have some cash. You know, so sometimes you go raise money because you're raising money to invest into some technology and to hire more expansion, all this expansion capital, all this other stuff. Sometimes you're raising money to have cash for a rainy day. And these are the times where it's important to have cash. When yeah. we went and raised money, and, and people are like, well, let's put that $6 million over here. Let's put that $4 million over here. Let's invest this. I said, no, 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 no. I want to keep this much cash. We don't need that much cash. I guarantee you we're going to need this much cash. Yeah. You're out of your mind. You're too conservative. No, no, I'm not conservative. I'm just telling you. you got to have cash. So there's going to be this whole bailout conversation, right? You know, the 2008 bailout versus today's bailout. They, you know... Uh, the bailout's really going to help a lot of Americans out. Well, first of all, the bailout's set up to bail out bigger companies, the too big to fail companies, yeah. which they're really worried about, right? And there's two school of thought with bailout. The bailout thought back in the days when an 08 happened and they gave all that money was, you shouldn't have bailed them out. Why? Because Ford would have bought GM. Well, do you want Ford to have a monopoly? No, we want GM to handle their finances better. Uh, okay, if there was no 2008, AIG would have probably been bought out by somebody else. You know, because of the bailout, Bank of America bought Countrywide. Chase bought WAMU. You saw a lot of those things taking place. Bear Stearns went out of business. You know, some of these companies went out of business. And I, I don't think it's a bad idea to allow some companies to go out of business. It's a filtering system. I, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to allow some other companies to buy the other companies pennies on a dollar because they lack discipline and the ones who buy have a little bit more discipline. Why don't you give them the opportunity to buy things on sale because they were able to save money and you don't need to bail them out through the government because some of these companies, they're sitting around like kids where, you know, the, the father or the mother that every time the kid screws up, they bail them out every single time. How many times are you going to bail out that kid until he learns? I had a guy that came up to me, a pastor, a very well-known pastor who changed my life. He came up to me and one day we had a conversation together about his son. And he wanted to do so much for his son. He loves his son so much. And he says, man, what did your dad do with you that I can't do with my son? I said, my dad and you both love their sons the same. No one loves the other son more. I said, your approach of loving your son was through bailing him out in money. You did not let him drop to the ground and lose everything. I went to my dad one day. I was in debt $49,000. I said, Dad, I want you to bail me out my $49,000. He says, I'm going to do one of the best things anyone's ever going to do in your life. You're going to learn how to be a man or you're going to lose it all. He says, what's that? He says, I'm not giving you a penny. I said, what kind of a dad are you? He says, you got to figure out a way to get out of this $49,000 debt. I said, I need some money from you. Not going to bail you out. What kind of a thing? What are you talking about? Not going to bail you out. Do you realize I was so pissed to my dad? I didn't talk to my dad for one month. One month, I didn't, and we lived together. I didn't talk to him for one, we were roommates. Didn't talk to him for one month. A month later, I kind of realized what he was doing, that his position, he was staying firm, and I knew how painful it was for his son to not want to talk to him because I love my kids. I would, yeah. I would be very hurt if my kids don't want to talk to me. 
but then look what he produced. You know, those are the things that we don't see behind closed doors. So we, we got we to gotta kind of be realizing that some people don't belong to, everybody wants to be called an entrepreneur, but some people just don't need to be entrepreneurs. Some people need yeah. to be more number two, number three, number four people in a company as intrapreneur, but it's not everybody's job to be an entrepreneur, and times like this filter those people out. I hate to say that. It's just that's uh, what it is. Now, on the opportunity side, billionaires are going to be produced. Uh, new billionaires are going to be born. New heroes are going to be born. People you read about five, ten years from now on how they created their wealth are going to do it during times like this. Yeah, and look, Patrick, I've been in my podcast for the last two years. I got kicked in the stomach in 2009 recession where I was nearly wiped out. We went to the scale to 500 and we sold it. And I've always said, keep a fund aside, always. Save, and you did a really good video. I think it was two years ago I watched it when you said, I think it's McDonald's or Starbucks or cash or holding cash and keep cash behind. Keep 10, I think it's 15% of your savings, your net worth, keep it to one side. And I did that, I, I knew that anyway. Whereas other people were saying, look, now nah, go all in, go all in. You know, cash is trash. And I knew, I'm, I've got a family, so I knew to keep that. And I'm now talking to the same people, asking for bailouts, asking when the government's going to fund them. And I'm thinking, you know what? It's going to be a harsh lesson, but you need to learn the lesson because with no cash, you've got no oxygen, right? And the business is dead. There's no question about it, man. There, look, yeah, here's, here's the best thing, man. This is, you know, my philosophy has always been be patient. Everyone's going to find the leaks in everyone's philosophies. And it's going to take 10 to 20 years to know which philosophy works during good times, bad times, great times, terrible times. And, and the bad philosophies are being filtered out today. That's yeah. all there is to it. The bad philosophies are being filtered out today. You know, people ask me, how come you don't make videos on parenting uh, videos, like how to be a great parent? How do I know if I'm a great parent? I'm going to know if I'm a great parent once I meet my grandkids. Not until yeah. then. Until then, I'm not going to know if I'm a great parent. When it comes down to people talking about cash being trash, that advice is hurting so many people today, it is not even funny. Some people that took it. But uh, some philosophies are evergreen philosophies. You know, is saving money is an evergreen philosophy. Having cash and emergency fund is an evergreen philosophy. That's not just effective during good and bad times. That's an evergreen philosophy that you should subscribe to. And some of those old philosophies are coming back. And the stuff that our grandparents told us about that we didn't put a lot of attention to, you're starting to think about it and say, well, maybe grandma was right. Maybe grandpa was right on what he said about cash. We're seeing that all over the place today. Yeah, and the, and the immigrant mindset, obviously my parents are from India and yours are from Iran, but they always, always kept cash because in them countries you needed cash. No one's going to bail you out. But going on the balance view, look, I'm watching a lot of content creators you are. I've seen a real change in, without naming any content creators, where... Because they've always had just one opinion, their content is lacking so much depth. One thing I like about you, Pat, and a lot of my followers have mentioned this, is you always get a balanced view. You will always get a balanced view. How, how do you maintain that against people who just say, oh, no, it's a, I know this stuff, I know this stuff. When I did this in 2009, I did this. But sometimes something, everything goes out the window sometimes. But how, how do you maintain the balanced view all the time? It, look, it, it, my parents, my mom and dad are like politically here. Mom's a communist, dad's an imperialist. So think about it. Like, one believes rich people are terrible human beings. The other one believes poor people are lazy. And, and they're both right and wrong, if that makes sense. Because there yeah. are rich people that are greedy, and there are poor people that are lazy who are entitled. But I also know poor people who are poor because, you know, certain things that happen to them. And I know rich people that are not greedy. They give away and they do the right things. I think the biggest part is the fact that I watched two different arguments my entire life, and I eventually realized the right place to be politically. You know, in America, you see the eagle, the way the eagle is, it's got the left wing, it's got the right wing, and when the, you know, the wings are kind of balanced, you fly the fastest. And that's why I, I'm generally on the middle. Uh, when both sides make their arguments, I kind of want to hear both sides and kind of see where they're coming from. And that gives me a lot of perspective. And then it's naive to believe you have all the answers. It's naive to believe that you're 100% right. It's naive to put things as 100%, even though many of us do it. It's just naive to do that because you don't really, like even today, you know, uh, my dad called me. He says, hey, he was a little bit worried. My dad's 77 years old. He says, he says, uh, 
man, this thing is really concerning me. I said, why are you concerned? He says, because it's a pandemic. I said, are you concerned because it's a pandemic or are you concerned because you've never experienced this before? He says, maybe because I've never experienced this before. I said, let me ask you a question. How old were you the first time you were bombed on? He says, what do you mean? I said, you lived in Iran since 1942. You were born in Iran. How old were you the first time an enemy bombed where you were living at? He said, I was 44. You were seven. I said, I remember that. I said, up until that day, had you ever been trained on 10 keys to success of being bombed on when you have a wife and two kids? He says, no, I had no clue. I said, I watched you like you don't even know. I was the camera that wasn't around. I watched every movement you made. And you know what you did? You were so calm and poised. And you gave me confidence. That's why I didn't cry. I don't look at mom because mom looked concerned. You gave me confidence when I looked at you. When I looked at you, I'm like, oh my gosh, everything's going to be fine. I said, we got bombed on 167 times in a day. You got us in a car. We drove over a bridge. Ten seconds later, you told us not to look back. We looked back. The bridge is coming down because the bridge got bombed on in Tehran. And then we went to a city called Karaj. And then Saddam bombed Karaj because all the manufacturers were there. And then we went to a city called Bandar Pahlavi, right outside of Rash. And then Saddam bombed the port because we were at the port. I said, how are we doing today after the war? Good. So when's the last time you thought about it? He said, I've never thought about it since then. I said, life's okay, ain't it? Yeah. I said, when's the last time you got experience on pandemic? This is the first time. I said, for you, it's 77 years. For yeah. me, it's 41 years. But we're going to be all right, Dad. Because we're survivors. We're fighters. We, historically, mankind's done okay. Dinosaurs couldn't make it out of this place. Well, we've made it out. We've been able to do okay. And I'm betting on everything's going to be all right. So as long as you do your part and stay home and not go out and take care of yourself because you're 77 and you're more, you, risk. your risk is a little bit higher, you take care of you, and then I'm going to do my part. I think at a time like this, you know, even though I'm at work, I'm at my office right now, something I shouldn't be doing. I'm taking a risk. I'm 41. I'm at work. And I decided to come to work. This is what I've been doing every day. I'm here seven days a week, by the way, not six days a week. It's generally six days. But right now, since the pandemic starts, I've been at the office seven days every day. I'm at the office coming to work. Some of my employees are not here. Matter of fact, 80% of my employees are not here. They're not here. They're at home. But I also have the balance take to know that, hey, if some people are worried about it, I get it. I'm not trying to pull. I'm just telling you this is my position that I take on what I'm doing. This is the choice that I made to come over here to the office. Some will disagree. Some will agree. I'm not saying you're wrong or I'm right. I'm just telling you it's my position. I think sometimes when we look at it from that perspective of understanding the motive behind people's opinions and thoughts, you'll be able to deliver your message better and connect with more people because you're understanding what their position may be. Cool. So look, I want to um, got a conclusion because you're giving so many tips there. So look, just to leave it on, on some tips for my listeners and viewers, you know, if you could leave some, share some tips on how you think they could use to get out of this, and you've mentioned some within the interview, how would you leave this interview, Patrick, if someone's trying to just kind of get some clarity around where to go and how to survive, if that makes sense? It's a great, so, so think, think about it this way. How important is it today to learn how to uh, uh, shoot an arrow? How important was that 1,500 years ago? Massive, massive. Was massive. It, yeah, yeah. How, how important? What, where would you oh, rank it? You need that for just looking after everything, to kill, to, to, to fall. Can you we know, say top on, 20? Yeah, top yeah, 20 I'd say skill. top 20, yeah, okay. definitely. Yeah, yeah. How important is it today to learn how to make fire in the woods? Low at the moment, unless we get evicted, but yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but how important is that, you know, 1,500 years ago? Yeah, yeah, very high, yeah. Could be a top five, right? So you have to think about what's important today. Yeah. Today. So what is important today? Learning how to make a three-way sale through the phone. Learning how to close FaceTime videos. Learning how to Zoom learning how to go live, learning how to create content, learning how to connect with people through social media. Those skills are top 20 today. Now that's skill sets, selling, negotiating, more important today than even it was six months ago. Because six months ago was other people being able to do it for you and you were okay. Yeah. There's never been a more important time to learn how to negotiate and sell than today. Because if you know how to negotiate and sell and you can't leave your house, you can pick up this phone and make some sales. You, you can pick up 
this phone and make some yeah. sales, you can figure out a way to make money from anywhere in the world because you know how to sell and negotiate. Yeah, and, and then it's about finding a product that's a service that's not a physical product that you can sell. How can you sell that product, right? And then, so, so those are how-tos. As far as mindset-wise goes, you know, today, you know, there aren't many skills more powerful than learning how to pivot, learning how to adjust, making the right adjustments and uh, pivoting and learning how to adapt. And then the, to the best of your ability, man, controlling your emotions today. Because, you know, anxiety attacks and panic attacks happen because you let your imagination loose. You got to bring your imagination back down. You got to bring them back down. It's like a dog with a leash. You cannot let a pit bull loose. Imagination is worse than a pit bull. You got to put them on a leash and hold them tight, okay? You control your imagination. If you allow fears and danger and sabotage control your imagination, let me tell you, you're going to have a very, very tough time going through these, uh, these stages because you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I watched a movie the other day and I watched this contagion and what if this happens and what if that happens? Oh my goodness, you're going to drive yourself nuts. So pivot, adjust, adapt, control your imagination, mindset, skill set, Zoom, three-way calls, negotiating, selling, social media, content creation, how-tos, you put those two together, everything's going to be all right. Yeah, thank you. I, and th that makes so much sense. I was on the BBC radio doing an interview and one thing they asked me, how's it for you? I've never been so busy. I'm doing so much content. I'm just planning, re-strategizing. I've got teams around different areas doing stuff. So you're right. If you pivot in the right way, you'll be so busy, you won't have time to, to, to stop. No but question. yeah, I, I, Patrick, you know, contrary to time, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, you always give great information and to get your second time was really amazing. I think the last time we spoke, you were on 1 million subs for your YouTube channel. Now you're at 2 point, I think it's 2.1 million. It might be, it's growing all the time. Um, how does that feel though, to get to, get to like 2 million point one subs? I can remember when you were like 1 million a couple of years ago. It's just gone crazy. I, I think 1 million was a bigger deal than 2 million. It's like making your first million. I think 10 million will be a big deal. So... Get oh, back to me when we cross 10 million. When we do, you're going to see me pretty excited at 10 million. Yeah, it might be soon. And we, and we still want to get you over the UK, want to get you to an event, which would be awesome because so many people love you in the UK. And I've got to say this because I put a post up yesterday and the, my phone kept pinging on Patrick's awesome. So we really value the content you're putting out that it is helping a lot of people. So thank you for that for me and everybody who contains your, you know, your content. Thank you for having me, man. I can tell you one thing. I, I got my book that's coming out. This is the yes. book I've been working on for three, four years, June 30th. On, uh, I think you can purchase it even right now on Amazon. It's called it's Your Amazon, Next yeah. Five Moves. Your, Your next. next Five Moves. You can get yeah. it on Amazon or Simon & Schuster or Barnes & Noble. It's, it's all the strategies that I use behind closed doors finally put into a book with a system that can apply to anybody's life. Whether it's in the war room, the boardroom, or the bedroom, these strategies are going to work for you. So if you haven't yet picked it up or been following it, you can go pick it up. Your next five moves that will come out June 30th. So we're going to share that on the links. We'll share all Patrick's links. You know where he is, everywhere. But uh, yeah, definitely, that'll be a great thing. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate you, buddy. Take care. So thank you for watching that video. If you want to see other videos and great guests, make sure you subscribe and like the video. So you can now head over to my website where you can see a bit of my story of building and scaling my businesses and also all the free resources and tools which you can help you on your journey in your brand and your business. You can also subscribe on the podcast so you can check on iTunes, Spotify and other locations where you can find the podcast. And I look forward to catching you very soon. Thank you.